All right, good afternoon. It's great to be here. I, I love a conference named Uptime. Um, I guess you could argue that a conference named Downtime would be even more appropriate for me, but I, I, I'll take Uptime. Uh, and it, it really been interesting to kind of watch all of these, of these talks today. Uh, and in particular, you know, I really enjoyed, the, if the clicker is going to work, if not, Probably not because it's not plugged in, so we'll just do it old school. Um, I, like, I, I, I thought Craig's talk was really interesting, and Craig talked about all these great attributes uh, that we have with kind of Kubernetes orchestrated things, and they're beautiful. I mean, you, you have all these things like you know immutability and, re and recoverability and so on, but the, the underlying them is a, as a foundational assumption that these services are essentially stateless. And we love statelessness. I love statelessness. Don't catch me being pejorative about statelessness because I love it. It's like the ability to model a program as our problem as a finite state machine. If you have the ability to do that, you should seize it because you can make code that's totally correct. And it's such a relief to be able to do that. I love statelessness. So stateless, stateless, yay, statelessness, except. The world is not stateless. In fact, even stateless things aren't stateless, right? Say that w when we talk about these stateless components, they actually have in-kernel state, they've got connection state, they've got, they've got active state, but it's transient state. It's state that we can drain out of them. Sadly, there is another darker kind of state in the world that we all depend on, persistent state. The stuff that's actually going to sit on a disk somewhere, on non-volatile storage somewhere. And we've done, actually, I think, a very good job of separating our concerns and making sure that those of us who are working on stateful services don't get to come to conferences where we get to talk about statelessness. So we don't get, it's like, wait a minute, like, I, immutability, restartability, recoverability. No, no, it's quiet, you. Back to your stateful service, please. Um, Beca and we've done a good job of separating that um, because, and it's important because statelessness does allow us so much and so much of the new code that we develop can be or should be stateless. So that's a good thing. But we do have this persistent state. Um, this data path does exist. Uh, and the, the data path is a dark and terrible place. So for the, just for purposes of my definition, the data path consists of the software, the hardware, and the firmware that connects that stateful service, that stateful service endpoint, all the way down to the actual non-volatility that stores that state. There's some non-volatile physical medium, which for right now is flash or magnetic media. Um, don't believe the death of disk, by the way. Um, I'm long enough to have heard the death of tape for several decades. Uh, disk is still very much with us. We'll talk about disks in, in, in great detail. But th that, b those bits are going to land on that non-volatile medium. And the data path is that entire path all the way back. Uh, in many ways, the data path is a journey back through time as, as you get closer and closer to the physical medium. You get closer and closer to DOS. Um, as you get closer and closer, which it, 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 that's a true statement, sadly. Um, so, and these systems that actually, deliver, that actually deliver this data path to us are themselves very complicated. These are complicated distributed systems built on top of these non-volatile media. We have these big, complicated distributed systems, and we need this data path to work. Uh, and we actually have great demands on the data path, and in order to be able to have this beautiful statelessness that you all enjoy, the stateful path, the persistent path, has to work all of the time. Um, it's really not okay for that path to be down at all. We demand perfection of that. And on, on the one hand, having to deliver that perfection can feel really difficult um, because it feels like the demands are so acute. On the other hand, if, if we can't actually rely on that persistence, it becomes really hard to build infrastructure elsewhere. So we really need this to work all of the time. So we demand that it is consistent, that it is available, and it is partition tolerant. That is what we demand of that stateful layer. Sadly, we know from Brewer's theorem that we can't actually have all of those things. And you know, I knew for a fact that I would not be the first talk to mention cap theorem. But it, Bridget uh, that, it hit us off the, the, this morning talking about cap theorem. And, and Bridget pointed out what Katie McCaffrey and others have also observed that, all right, consistency, availability, or partition tolerance, pick two. You're like, I know, I know, I know. I want consistency and availability. It's like, no, 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 put your hand down. You have to pick partition tolerance. It's like, but I do not want partition tolerance. I'm like, I know you don't want it. You have to take it, actually. So you, it's actually a choice between consistency and availability. They say, but I don't have partitions. It's like, no, no, you're having one right now. Um, so um, 
it is actually important that we don't actually get to not pick partition tolerance. We have to pick partition tolerance. And then the question is, now we're going to make trade-offs. Now, it can be easy to be like, OK, cap theorem, original sin, OK, screw it. Like, let's all just get stoned because like, life is meaningless and we can't actually do anything. And there's, there's actually a, I, I really want to watch, by the way, that this, watching this later is going to be such a treat for me. <laughs> um, so, um, but the, the, uh, we shouldn't actually use cap theorem as an excuse to give up on humanity because, and actually there's a very interesting paper that came out of Google later explaining that like, well, okay, it is true that like you can only pick, you, you have to pick two of these, you have to pick partition tolerance, but it's also true that if you engineer the system very carefully, you actually can engineer partitions away. Like, ah, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I pick consistency of the ability. It's like, no, no, easy, easy, easy. Because it's actually exceedingly difficult to engineer partitions away. It's exceedingly difficult. It takes a very long period of time. And that's what we're going to talk about in this talk. We're going to talk about the difference between a system that is that it theoretically has made cap trade-offs and one that is actually resilient, in which we have done the best we possibly can uh, to actually engineer these things away. Because the difference between those two systems, by the way, are the zebras. What are the zebras? So zebras, and if you are, I, I'm the son of a physician, which is going to become relevant in just a second, um, but if you are a med school dropout, or if you're a physician yourself, um, or if, if, if you just like following medicine, you may have heard the term a zebra. A zebra is a, it, it's medical slang, um, and it denotes a, a condition that is rare and exotic, but can be confused with something much more common. So med students and residents are very prone to want to diagnose the most exotic thing you could possibly have. It's like, oh, you're sick after the conference? Cerebral malaria, it must be that. It's like, well, okay, yeah, maybe not. Um, but it may be, I, I'm running a fever, there could be other symptoms that you would share with cerebral malaria, but let's not jump to cerebral malaria. And this aphorism, which was coined by a physician in Maryland uh, in, in the 40s, when you hear hoofbeats, Think of horses, not zebras. Okay, so, and this is for, for a hospital, this makes sense. For a hospital where when, when you solve an ailment, it doesn't prevent someone else from having that same ailment, sadly. It's not software. You can't actually just like push a fix for cerebral malaria. Uh, so it actually makes sense to be constantly aware of what is common, what is likely. I don't want to go to the most unlikely thing. That said, and the, the, the soft underbelly of medicine is that zebras do exist. And if you have had one of these yourself, you know the suffering involved when you actually do have one of these rare exotic conditions. When you do have cerebral malaria, by the way, if you ever go to a malarial region, come back to the United States and you're ill six months later, be sure to volunteer to your physician that you've been in a malarial region. That's a very important data point because you will suffer in, for a long time potentially cerebral malaria. And I had one of these that was close to home. So as I mentioned, my father was a physician, emergency medical physician. I used to think growing up that being a physician was the easiest job on earth because you just look very thoughtfully at this injured child and then say, you'll be fine. <laughs> and then if it's really serious, I mean, if you're obviously bleeding all over everywhere, and this is clearly a medical emergency, and you really have to dig much deeper, you simply say, we'll keep an eye on it. So that to me was being a physician. I'm like, this is a pretty easy gig. Like, you know, um, you'll be fine, and let's keep an eye on it. And actually, I had a friend in college, uh, and she, the, she w w had an ailment. She's like, hey, let's call your dad, and you, would you mind calling him and ask him what's going on? I'm like, oh, you can call my dad, but I'll just like, save you the time, and you'll be fine. That's easy. So, you know, I actually want like a real medical opinion. I'm like, all right, then we'll keep an eye on it. There you go. We're done. Okay, you don't need a more medical opinion than that. But then she actually prevailed on me to call my father, and I, I, my father spoke with her for a while, and then handed the phone back to me, and he, my dad says to me something I had never heard before since, yeah, Brian, she's got to be seen. I'm like, oh my God, you're going to die. Like, that's the morgue that you go to as far as I'm concerned. So, um, it, but so why did my father say that? Because she was suffering from abdominal pain. And if, just for life lesson, uh, this may be the most important thing you take out of this talk, abdominal pain is actually something that you don't want to screw around with. If you're suffering from abdominal pain, there could be a lot that is wrong with you, and you should actually call an advice nurse, present yourself to a physician. Because uh, unlike kind of the scrapes and bruises that, that a child has, abdominal pain can be very serious. And my sister had very acute abdominal pain. My sister was on her way to Ghana with her boyfriend, now husband, and they were, had a layover in London, and she had such excruciating belly pain that she could not get on the flight. 
she, they, they went to the hospital, uh, determined that she had appendicitis, um, and they gave her an appendectomy. They gave her a laparoscopic appendectomy in the UK. Uh, totally changed her position on socialized medicine, by the way, which is a very interesting kind of thing. Um, but she had a laparoscopic appendectomy. Uh, they also discovered, by the way, that uh, as an aside on the side, um, that she has what's called a pseudocolonesterase deficiency. And I know that she, we've already talked about pseudocolonesterase, so she's gonna crush it. <laughs> Boom! Um, so, my, my sister has, and, and now you can actually go Google it. I think I'm on space balls. Um, so, but my sister had a pseudocolonesterase deficiency, which means that she could not metabolize the anesthesia that she had. When they extubated her, she stopped breathing. And um, because um, there was different standards of care where she was, um, they didn't notice until she got blue in the face. Um, I encourage you to do what I do, we'll go back to that in a second, I encourage you to do what I do, yeah, exactly, a little preview. Um, I encourage you to do what I do, and I know she won't mind, claim my sister as your own sister the next time you're having surgery, and say, you know, it's funny, I've got a sister, I, I don't have any allergies to medicine that I'm aware of, but I do have a sister with a pseudocolonesterase deficiency. And all of a sudden, watch your anesthesiologist wake up. They're like, wait, wait, what, what did you just say? I, Oh, hold on, okay, oh, I, I gotta get the red bracelet out. So they get the red bracelet out, you get the red bracelet on you. The red bracelet's like, hey everybody, time to wake up so you don't kill me. Which of course everybody should have when they go into surgery, but you only get one of these if you have a sister with a pseudocolonesterase deficiency, so a doctor has your own. <laughs> so, my, so my sister is, we're done. Laparoscopic appendectomy, we're, we're done. She's in a wedding in California, and she has the same acute abdominal pain. Um, this time, much worse. She goes to the hospital again, they see tear, they still have got no idea what's going on. Uh, in fact, they believe that they've found something in her abdomen and they're wondering if she has any kind of like strange, like if she's into anything weird. My sister's not into anything weird, so she's just like, what are you even talking about? Um, and th they, they didn't actually know what was going on, and my father at this point had lost his patience and said another thing that I never heard him say, but uh, it's definitely exciting when your father's a physician, he said, you need to give her an exploratory laparotomy or I'm gonna give her an exploratory laparotomy. And now I had my father give me stitches on the kitchen table, but never an exploratory laparotomy. Like, that was gonna be cool. And I'm like, come on, Dad, give her the exploratory laparotomy. Um, but they did it, they cut her open, and what did they find? They, um, what they found is emphatically a zebra. Um, they found this. Um, so um, this is a, was a piece of my sister's gut um, from the time that she was actually conceived. Um, this is something called a Meckel's diverticulum. And the, the Meckel's diverticulum is, is a, a little umbilicus that you have before your true umbilicus forms. This is like post for your umbilicus. Post being the power on self-test that runs before the bias. This is the thing for which the bias is like the really high level software. Um, so post is, it, for, this is, and this is obliterated after seven weeks post gestation. So you're very much in utero. For to approximately 2% of people, that's not completely ob obliterated. And there's a little eddy in your gut. And for approximately 2% of those people, they'll become symptomatic. They'll develop this thing called a Meckel's diverticulum or Meckel's diverticulitis. That is all under the age of two. That all of those cases essentially happen over the age of two. My sister was presenting as a 29-year-old with Meckel's diverticulitis. These are, the, the, these are some of the largest Meckel stones ever pulled out of anybody. Um, because these were sitting in her body since she was a kid. And it explained so much all along. I thought she was constantly complaining about kind of aches and pains growing up. It's because she was walking around with a bag of gravel in her gut. Um, and like my sister does not have a lot. I mean, she and I are, this is my, it is my closest living relative. Like we're basically like a bag of bones. Like there's not a lot of extra space for a bag of gravel. But you can see how large this is. The, it, the, the point is that this is something that took a long time to diagnose, that was misdiagnosed a lot, and it is, on the one hand, it doesn't happen frequently, but when it does happen, it can be really, really debilitating. Well, let's talk about the data path. Let's talk about zebras in the data path. Because <laughs> we do very much have zebras in the data path, because we've got all of these different software components. And software, if you're having a bad day, and you need me to remind you of this, software is really amazing. Software is Unlike anything we have ever done, software is its own thing because software has this incredible paradox in that it is both information and machine. It has all these properties of machine, and today we've been talking about all these kind of mechanical properties of software. It's not a machine. It's information. 
and it lives like information. I know we, we like to think that everything is broken all the time and everything was written last night. That's actually not the case. And it's not the case because that software that functions, that survives in perpetuity, never raises its hand to tell you anything. It just works. And we have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of software in that great big stack of software that date back to the very dawn of software. We've got lots of software that just works. And that's the great news, is that when it works correctly, it survives in perpetuity. The problem is, it's very expensive, like impossible, to rewrite all of that. We wouldn't want to rewrite all that, because it took us so long to get it right. What that means is, the bugs that are left are nasty. The horses have all been found. The horses have been found over decades. The only thing that is left are the zebras. And we, we, when, good news is when we find a zebra, we can eradicate that zebra. The bad news is it's only zebras that are left. So to, um, in terms of like how do we actually go hunt zebra, let's go zebra hunting. And I don't mind like picking on zebras, by the way, too much. You know, like, oh, I love zebras. Like, yeah, you don't actually love zebras. Zebras have got a really foul temper. So I, I actually don't mind picking on the zebra. I'd be ha you know, I'm not going to actually go hunting a zebra, but I'm happy to metaphorically hunt zebra. Um, so in particular, when we're hunting these things, we, we should not ever assume that a problem is reproducible. If we can reproduce a problem out of production, great. That should never be our going in assumption. Our going in assumption should always be that we need to debug it in situ in production. We can't ask, well, let's go reproduce it somewhere else. Like, no, we're not going to go try to reproduce it somewhere else because this is an extremely strange thing, pathology that's going on. You're not going to recreate my sister's condition in anybody else be because it, only, it is so unusual. So many of these conditions are very, very, very unusual. And when we have one of these unusual con conditions, we can be, especially, and I put bias for action in quotes here, um, because I am, um, I, I'm making a reference to Amazon's principles, which troll me into a stupor. Um, one of Amazon's leadership principles um, include bias for action. And okay, I'm okay with bias, like, tell me more. When we are overly biased for action, we can be biased for rash action. Um, and it's easy to be biased for, for, for panic. It's easy to be, to be biased for haste. And we don't want to take the rash action. And in particular, restarting a component, killing a component, is the wrong first motion for something that's misbehaving in production. I, we, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed Jason's presentation where he had the, that full kind of story, but I did wince a little bit when we don't actually know what Greg did. To this Greg, Greg took the process out back and did something to it terrible, and now the service is fine. It's like, yes, but what happened to that pit? Like, we don't talk about that process anymore. Like, that process, it's like, okay. Uh, it just, like, disappeared. Um, and... Because you want to actually understand, and I'm going to assume, because actually Jason didn't fill in the back gap, so I'm going to assume that Greg saw that the process was behaving pathologically and took all of the necessary information that he would need to later debug it and then restarted it, of course. I mean, that, that, I'm, just, I'm going to assume the best of Greg. Um, but it, we, when we actually have a service, it is the wrong bias to immediately restart it. The first bias is not, shouldn't be to change the, question, uh, change the system, but to observe it. Ask questions. Because, and I thought, again, I really enjoyed Jason's full timeline because you appreciate what a tiny fraction of that is actually on system. And I think this is true for many outages where you got all of this, this work beforehand actually getting the right person on the keyboard. You don't need to save yourself 20 seconds right now. If you can get enough information to figure out what's going on so we fix the problem, please do so. So your first bias shouldn't be to change the system, but to observe it. And by the way, don't go to a hypothesis first. Ask a question first. Debugging is the process of asking questions and getting answers, not necessarily formulating hypotheses. A hypothesis should happen very, very late in the process, which may be seconds later, but it should happen very late in the process when the questions and answers have constrained the hypothesis space so much that you basically know what it is. You know what is consistent with all of the data. So do not jump to a conclusion. And if, if there's one thing that I see that frustrates me, it's when people immediately, oh, look, look, restart this, restart that, reboot that, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We could be missing tons of opportunity to find deeper, more systemic issues. The process that's spinning, 
that we're going to reboot is that maybe that's spinning because it can't talk to some other service. Maybe it's spinning because it can't talk to some other service that it ain't even supposed to be talking to. You can discover an amazing amount when these systems misbehave if you ask questions and get answers, but it means that we have to be able to observe the system. The observability of the system is truly paramount. So for us at Joint, observability, I think it's fair to say, is our organizing principle. It is, more than anything else, what bonds us as, as engineers, as, uh, from, uh, the, uh, across the company, we believe that these systems should be observable. Um, and that's part of the reason we made some of the choices that we've made. So um, if you're wondering what, what my shirt is about, in terms of there's no place like user source UTS, and if you're thinking I'm missing a, a leading forward slash, I'm not. User source UTS is the source base for Illumos, which inherits the Solaris heritage, which goes all the way back to Unix, and SmartOS is our derivative of that. So we've got our own derivative of a Lumos because it's designed to observe the system around ZFS and DTrace and zones. Um, so observability is very, very important to us. We developed Manta, and Manta is, is our S3-like service, although it's container-centric. You can spin up a container on an object. So in addition to being able to put an object and get an object, you can actually spin up a container where an object lives and save yourself the, the having to move that object somewhere else. So it's our container-centric object store. Uh, it, it's got ZFS at its core. We use sharded Postgres. Um, we use ZK for leader election. You're like, oh, Zookeeper. OK, if you just throw up in your mouth a little bit, like, it, it was actually 2012 when we designed this thing. So um, I, you, if someone could also, in, invi in addition to inventing Raft, if they could also invent the time machine that they can shove Raft into, that would be awesome. But meanwhile, we're stuck with ZK. But it, actually, ZK, like all things ZK, ZK, once you get it running, it's, it behaves, right? It's, it's, uh, the, it's the getting it running that is a real challenge with, with ZooKeeper. And all of our services are primarily in Node.js. And for us, and if you think, like, wait a minute, JavaScript, I thought you said you were about observability and debuggability. We are, and we spent a lot of time on on the observability and debuggability of JavaScript and Node.js. Uh, and Node, and actually, it is still the reason we use Node is because Node is actually more observable for us than any other platform um, other than C. So we are able to, to, and we've used it over and over and over and over again, the ability to G-core a running Node process, restart that Node process such that service is restored, and then later go on to understand why are we using so much memory, not why is GC running so much. Right? It's like, GC is my problem. It's like, actually, your problem is you're using too much memory. Right? And GC is trying to help you out, but it can't actually find your garbage because you have too much crap in your house. So help GC out, right? Um, and we've used it over and over and over again to be able to actually detrace these things, use MDB, and so on. So we, we, observability, very, very important to us. Uh, and Joint, as you may or may not be aware of, Joint was actually bought by Samsung. So we were bought by Samsung a year ago because Samsung wanted to build their own private cloud. They saw Manta, they saw Triton, which is our also open source uh, uh, system for container management and for, and for cloud management. And they realized that they needed to have, they needed to control their own fate with their own physical computers. So I'm one of the renegades that believes that Jeff Bezos is not going to own every physical computer in the arbitrary limit. So I know it's a very, it's a tough assumption, but just go with me for a second. Um, so Samsung bought Joint, um, and um, as a result, w the scale we're now seeing with Manta is now at Samsung scale, which is a whole different level of scale, like the M's all turn into B's um, when you're dealing with Samsung. This is a very, very, very large company with a very, very, very large footprint that is very assertive about getting all of their stuff onto to Manta and Triton. It's very exciting. The good news is that between the years of production we've had on Manta, uh, all of the observability, the hyperscale post-Samsung, we've nailed some really thor thorny stuff in Manta. Feels great. That's great. Here's the bad news. The bad news is that our stack and every other data path that's out there, we still have these components that are really problematic for us that actually cause us an enormous amount of downtime, if not in the aggregate, at least in the small, and it's very, very hard to resolve. So, well, why don't you just rewrite those pieces of software, I hear you asking. And I, I have those same desires. The problem is that there is, there, there is a zebra sanctuary in our stack. Deep, deep, deep in the stack. And this is where you get to not just metaphorical DOS, but literal DOS. There are these little proprietary components that sit so closely to the hardware, they are helping the hardware lie to the software about what it actually is. Who are, the, the, who is this terrible software? This is firmware. Um, and right now, humanity is engaged in a silent war it is us versus firmware, and you all need to choose which side you're going to be on. Because 
the, the, the firmware, is, and the, the problem is, it operates so silently. It's so deep in the stack. I mean, when you take out a motherboard, when you take out a disk controller, you take out a NIC, you see all of these controllers on here that are all running little operating systems that all have their own little firmware bits that are all being delivered out of someone's home directory who no longer works for the company because it's so screwed up there. You know that when you're looking at it. You're like, I, like, I am looking into source code that they've lost right now. I can feel that. I can feel, like, it's warm to the touch if I feel it. Um, and the problem is that firmware that, that operates silently also fails implicitly. The, the, the firmware, by the way, is not wired up to your beautiful monitoring system. Like, the firmware is not going to page you. That, that's, way too, that's way too much work for the firmware. It's like, well, I could, I could page the operators, or I could just not do this, actually. I'm just actually like, not going to go to school. I, uh, let's try that. This is like, you know, my, my 12 year old's experiment with math tests. Like, what if I don't go to school? It's like, that doesn't work. What are you, firmware? Out of my house. Um, <laughs> and so with, 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 let's go through some of the, the, the various parts. So, so, and we're going to go through some of these various dark bits. Um, we'll start with the spindle. I did love uh, what someone said earlier about, oh, well, these aren't like simple mechanical systems. Like, oh, <laughs> simple mechanical systems. OK, so the, the, the disk, rotating magnetic media, is a mechanical marvel. Would anyone guess the fly height of the head on a drive? Does anyone know the fly height of a drive? Any guesses? Five nanometers, an excellent guess. And if I didn't know better, I would say five nanometers. That seems a little aggressive, but I would go more like maybe 10 nanometers. 0.8 nanometers. And the <laughs> when I was talking to an exec at a disk drive company when he said that, and all of us were just like, whoa. I'm like, you mean 800 picometers? He's like, yeah, I guess I do mean 800 picometers. Son of a gun. It's like, this is an extremely small amount of space. 800 picometers. Um, ah, gibberish. Ah, that's useful. You, you know, my kids are going to find this incredibly useful when they see this. Um, so these things are so low, you can imagine, honestly, if the head hits a particle of smoke, it can crash. That can crash the head. That is how, uh, how fine they are, how finely machined they are. It is incredible. Any particulates in there, magnetic aspersions, certainly wear, certainly, certainly, certainly vibe, um, certainly temp, um, all of these things actually will fail. The disk will fail, this, uh, this amazing mechanical marvel. Um, but the disk actually knows this, <laughs> amazingly enough. The disk is actually aware of the fact that it, that it is cheating physics all the time. And it has this incredible map of like, oh, okay, oh, wait, must have hit a particle of smoke there. Okay, don't go there. Um, and it has this, this map of the drive, and it knows where it's going and where it can't, which is, and it's storing your data many times redundantly on that drive, and it is able to reassemble that. I mean, the, the drive is incredibly, incredibly sophisticated, which is amazing, but that's also a lot of software, and it leaves some much nastier failure modes, uh, namely, you've got software-based failure modes. So disks absolutely can read and write the wrong data. And you're like, how is it that you can have a fly height of 0.8 nanometers, and yet you're giving me the wrong block address? It's like, well, eh, that's, that's hardware versus software. I don't know. What do you want me to tell you? Um, but a disk absolutely can return the wrong data. It can write the wrong data. And we saw this reality coming in the early 2000s. And ZFS is very much designed around this full path data integrity such that ZFS knows what it wrote where. And it can verify that when it's pulled off of the spindle. Um, I don't know why anybody at this point, especially given that it's open source, would rely on anything other than ZFS to, to store their data, but it's your data. Um, so ZFS has been huge for that, and we've discovered all sorts of data corruption. I do love ZFS will discover data corruption in things that are too expensive to have data corruption. You're like, you realize that doesn't follow. It, like, it doesn't, actually, doesn't actually matter how much you paid for this. It's like, no, but I paid way too much money for this SAN to have data corruption. It's like, well, it has data corruption. As it turns out, when you're paying that much money, what you're actually paying for is the right to have an executive VP lie in your office and weep for forgiveness. That's the actual <laughs> service that you're buying. You're not actually, it's like, oh, yeah, no, no, we corrupt data all the time. But um, where should I send the EVP on uh, tiers, maximal tiers, small tiers? What do you want? Um, that's what you're actually buying. So we, we saw all sorts of crazy data corruption. We saw data corruption in things that we felt couldn't possibly have data corruption. We saw data corruption in a controller where the last 64 bytes 
of many kinds of pages would simply not be DMA'd out. And there were millions and millions and millions of these controllers, and we spent a lot of time debugging ZFS before we came to the reluctant conclusion that it was not ZFS. ZFS was actually accurately reporting that the data was wrong. So uh, um, it's been amazing, but even ZFS oversimplified the failure modes of disks. Disks have got lots of ways to fail that are not simply reading and writing the wrong data. And in particular, uh, you know when I have retained a firmware rev, it's bad news. Um, and the Seagate Barracuda SU0D, I will meet you in the afterlife. Um, this was a firmware that had, there was a logic error in the, in the software that controlled the head, and it misapplied the polarity of the head, such that instead of decelerating the head when it got to a high logical block address, you would attempt to accelerate the head when it got to a high logical block address. And the disk itself, the JTAGs on the actual spindle would bounce the spindle to prevent you from actually destroying the drive. And what you would see is this strange 558 millisecond outlier. Like, what is that? And that is the time it took that drive to reboot. And because you would see it at a high logical block address, you would have these arrays of storage that were fine and happy and happy and happy and sad, 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 massive sad, sadness everywhere. Um, and very, 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 very frustrating when these things are not doing what you feel they should be doing. Um, those are the spindles. Uh, I think with Flash, we were very early in Flash, so at Sun, um, I developed along with Adam Leventhal and others, we developed one of the, the, the very first array to really use Flash, and we saw inside that sausage factory a little too much. So with Flash, we saw this entire operating system in the actual SSD that is responsible for where leveling and all the scheduling and so on. So we were, and I have been and still am very concerned about SSD failure because there is so much that can fail. Ironically, because we've been so concerned about those failures, we actually at, at Joyent and even at Sun back at the time haven't really suffered serious flash problems because we over-engineer the heck out of our SSDs. So we, get, we, we have SSDs that have, allow way more drive rights per day. In fact, we want so many drive rights per day, they're like, we don't actually make one like that. You're like, well, go find a way because we want to have very reliable SSDs because I've always been concerned about the, if it's not a word, I, am, I fear it will become one, the flash catastrophe of having many SSDs fail at once in the same way, which is completely conceivable given the, 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 the complexity of software running in the SSDs, the, the complexity of firmware in the SSDs. Um, the, the HBA, the, the host bus adapter, um, is the thing that actually takes an I.O. from the operating system and actually sends that off to a disk. How complicated could that possibly be? Glad you asked, excruciatingly complicated. Everything can go wrong with this. There, there can be many bits of firmware. You can have something called a SAS expander that is actually sitting between the HBA and the disks. There's all sorts of, of ways to make this excruciatingly complicated. And these HBA firmware where loves to just drop I.O. when it's under load. Um, I mean, okay, look, everyone loves this. I would love this. Like, the ability to just, like, drop work when you're under load, there's only one body of software that can get away with that, and that's the TCP IP stack. It is actually funny when you look at the code where you're just like, wait a minute, you're in a condition that you don't like. And literally the comment is like, ah, this is a really complicated condition to handle. Free message. It's like, what? It's like, eh, it's fine. If it's important, they'll resend it. It's like, whoa, you can do that? It's like, that's like me and my mail. It's like, well, I haven't opened this for six months, and I don't seem to be arrested, so all right. Um, <laughs> wow, you can do that. I didn't know you could do that. So the, um, the network encode gets to get, get away with that. Of course, that, you're, like, that engineer, of course, is inducing some, some hair-pulling latency bubble for some other engineer thousands of miles and perhaps thousands of years away, but uh, it is what it is. But the, the, the HPA, however, can't do this. The HPA is not allowed to just like, decide it doesn't want to come to work in the morning. Um, it actually needs to do I.O. And so what you, you will see is these systems that are, are running along, barreling along, and all of a sudden they'll grind to a halt because one I.O. went MIA. And you say, wait a minute, how can one I.O. possibly cause the entire system to dogpile behind it? Glad you asked. Um, because in a complicated system, it's really easy to have these implicit interdependencies where that one I.O., that's the Uber block that ZFS needs to write out. Like, we need that I.O. to complete or not complete. We don't care which. Like, either come to work or don't come to work, but you need to tell me either way, right? So you can't actually just, like, go missing. Um, and these latency outliers, um, and, you know, after ZFS, we'll retry it. The I.O. stack will retry it. So you'll just see a latency outlier. We actually saw one of these recently where it was so far up the stack, we were trying to figure out why we're getting all these RSTs. 
Um, because TCP is like, what's going on with that guy? Like, actually, RST the connection. It turns out what they, they hit a, a latency outlier with the HBA. So these things can be really serious. And of course, that was solved with a firmware update, which is just like, ugh. Um, I did not need, by the way, I needed no additional substance for this talk. But just because I, I, the universe loves to biblically punish me in this way, when I conceived of this talk, I had a conga line of broken firmware that made its way to me. And we had all sorts of issues just in the last couple of months around this. Um, another one is the DIM. Um, so the um, DRAM, right? We love DRAM. I love, 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 love DRAM. Uh, and part of the reason actually, uh, w the SSDs actually did not quite take off the way many of us thought they would because DRAM is so great. It's so fast. It's so cheap. I love DRAM. Instill it until it fails. And DRAM can fail for a bunch of, of reasons that have to do with the hardware. Um, you can have corrosion. You can have humidity. You can have a bunch of environmental factors. But one of the challenges we have with DRAM is that as the speeds have increased and the voltages have dropped, we are seeing more transient errors on DRAM. We are seeing more signal integrity issues. We are seeing more issues where the box simply resets with an uncorrectable error. And one thing that is very maddening is that you have these boxes that see an uncorrectable error and never saw a correctable error. It's like, how did we possibly, just physically, if we're going to have one of these issues, physically, you expect to see correctables before the uncorrectable. What happened to the correctable error? Oh, we sent that to the firmware with, and I'm not making this up, and they actually capitalized it this way, the firmware first model. It's like, is Donald Trump actually in my firmware right now? It's like. <laughs> I, this is like firmware first. I got like the firmware marching through my machine. It's like, no firmware first. No, I'm sorry. No, no, no. And I will be unequivocal about this. There, was not, there were not errors on both sides in this case. <laughs> I, 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 I want to be unequivocal. Firmware first is the wrong model for error handling. And so honestly, not a joke. So there's something called the CMCI, which is the, is the correctable memory check interrupt, which allows the operating system to know that a bunch of correctables are going on. And I'm talking to the vendor like, yeah, we don't do that. Um, we've changed the bias, and we've added a feature called cloaking. I'm like, call, you're confessing a crime to me right now, basically. Like, do you want to, you should call your lawyer. It's like, where do I turn off cloaking? It's like, no, no, you can't turn off cloaking. It's like, where did you tell me about cloaking? We don't tell you about cloaking. It's like, okay, this is actually illegal. Um, <laughs> and, the, and what actually happens is, that, so why can you not give me an interrupt when you see a correctable error? Oh, because we would give you too many interrupts. It's like, you give me too many interrupts. Okay, how many errors do we see on DRAM? They're like, oh, all the time. All the time, all the time. I, I've ha on, on some of these calls, I've half expected these guys to be like, can I, can I work with you, please? Can you get me out of here? Because nothing works over here. Um, it is actually terrifying, the, the rates of failure that, that we are seeing. And I believe we are seeing right now a silent epidemic of DIM failure. And so the next time your EC2 instance just kind of mysteriously disappears and come back, you can wonder if it wasn't firmware first uh, and your app last uh, in terms uh, of what actually happened. Uh, in terms of the chassis, you would think, okay, like the chassis surely has to be immune from software. And I'm like, well, I'm glad you think that. It's very cute that you think that. Um, unfortunately, the chassis is also managed by a bunch of software. Um, there's a system controller on the chassis. That system controller is often responsible for managing the fans. Um, and if those fans are mismanaged, they can actually do damage to the box. Um, one of the amusing errors we had in years past was that the system controller itself ran out of memory, it ran out of its own memory such that if you told it to reset itself, it would tell you that it doesn't know who it is. <laughs> um, and it's like, I do not know what you're talking about. I'm talking about you. Like, right, you're right here. Sorry, never mind. Uh, and when that happened, the fans would run full speed. And when that happened, the spindles started getting all sorts of latency. It, uh, uh, we had boot spindles on there that had all sorts of latency issues. So vibe can be serious, and you're, you're going to wear those things out. So you can actually have zebras in the chassis as well. You can have zebras in the NIC. Um, there's a ton of firmware on the network interface card. There are, there are optics that connect that, that network interface card to the top of rack switch. All of those things can fail, and they actually do. And it becomes very tempting to say, like, OK, the optics are going to fail. Let's use link aggregation. Let's actually have two links together and use them as one. Like, OK, that sounds great. It feels great. It's like, now we're going to be redundant, except we're also a lot more complicated. And hopefully, one of the themes that you take away from this 
is that the world is actually very, very complicated, too complicated as it is right now. And we need to be very mindful about making it more complicated in the name of availability. Because that complexity will cut against the very availability that we're trying to deliver. And in the case of LACP, you've got something else called MLAG. MLAG is the thing where the, the actual two switches need to talk to one another to make sense of these two links that are talking to it. And that is like the last code path to be verified by switch vendors. We have found so many switch bugs in MLAG. So very, very frustrating there, which leads us to the top of rack switch. The top of rack switch can do, the top of rack switch may actually be the firmware in the top of rack switch. If you actually want to, uh, you as firmware, wish to, to, uh, to have a blow against humanity, the place to start is the firmware in the top of rack switch because the, the blast radius of a firmware mistake in the top of rack switch is enormous. So we, we had a, um, actually it was very helpful for us um, when we were doing a POC, uh, uh, the due diligence before Samsung actually bought Joyent, and they had a bunch of hardware they wanted us to run on. Hardware that they had found in a dumpster, I'm, I'm quite certain, which was actually very useful because we saw all sorts of new failure modes in the software. This thing just like could not hold on to ARP tables to save its mind. And so it would constantly just chuck all of its ARP tables and the entire system would go split brain as everyone tries to figure out what's going on and all this Substack software gets very, gets very confused. We had another switch, not that one. We had, we had another switch, which liked to DDoS the system as kind of like a hobby, like when it wasn't actually routing traffic. Um, and in particular, you could send it a single malformed packet, and it would begin to broadcast that malformed packet to everybody in perpetuity. It's like, thank you very much. Um, and that actually, that bug was so bad, the vendor actually apologized, something that very rarely happens. Um, and it is, it's zebras all the way up, right? We, we're talking at the kind of the, the, the very lowest bits of the stack, but these things have manifestations way, way up the stack. And of course, software gets it wrong all the time. I, it's, it's not necessarily software versus firmware. Remember, it's firmware versus humanity, not software versus firmware. The software gets it wrong too, but the software that we can see that's open source, we can actually do something with. I mean, the, honestly, the, the person that may have most single-handedly advanced the quality of the software that we rely on in the data path may well be Kyle Kingsbury with Jepson. So Jepson is a, is, is a software suite that takes these distributed systems and sees, it, it just checks out to see if it does what the distributed system claims that it does. And very frequently, it doesn't. They're not linearizable, they're not serializable. They, they get data out of order. They have all sorts of pathologies. And the, unfortunately, it's gotten a little bit boring now because everybody knows to ru do their Jepson run before they announce that they've solved all problems. It used to be a couple years ago that people would announce that they've solved all problems, and then you'd do the Jepson run, which is a lot more exciting um, because you discover all sorts of pathologies. But we can do that when we're up stack. We can do that when, you can do that on RethinkDB. RethinkDB, by the way, not dead. I just want to say that. We, I, I had the CNCF and the Linux Foundation bought the source code for RethinkDB, very much alive. But you can do that for RethinkDB. You can do that for these databases and, and have some assurance. There is, no, there is no Jepson for firmware. Firmware, like, is its own Jepson, I guess. I don't even know. It's like, it is its own chaos monkey. But we, um, that's part of the challenge we have. And I think one of the things that I see is that these components are actually becoming less reliable. That I, something that I am very concerned about is that these components that we build on are getting less reliable over time. And the fact that we have software that can deal with unreliable hardware is not an excuse for unreliable hardware. And by the way, this is what the, the hyperscale folks have figured this out. You know, Google loves to have the kind of, it is a beautiful myth. I mean, it's a fact, but it's also a myth about the, the motherboards that are just shoved in with Velcro, right? And you, know, you walk into Google and you see, and this is like you know, the very first deployments of Google, they just bought the cheapest motherboards they could find. They would do anything to save a nickel, and they just had Velcro on the side of the motherboards and just shoved it into a rack, just motherboards. And it feels great, but it's a terrible idea because you can't actually build reliable infrastructure on that kind of quicksand. You actually need to have much more, a, a much more stable foundation. So this is not, our, our reliable software should not be an excuse for unreliable components. Uh, and then a little Blue Oyster Cult reference, um, I would encourage people to not fear the zebra. Um, the, on the one hand, the data path should not be undertaken lightly. Um, one thing that I do find a little frustrating is when people endeavor to, to walk the trail of the data path without realizing that you're not going backpacking, you're going into a war zone. 
and if you don't have your Kalashnikov packed, you don't appreciate the severity of the situation. So the, 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 when we are going into the data path, uh, we should not be deploying brand new software to the data path. Uh, and by the way, that software should, uh, it, it, when that software is early on in its life, it should never be giving you the wrong data. It, should, it will have other failure modes. I think, you know, I saw ZFS, my data was some of the very first data that was on ZFS. ZFS didn't give you the wrong data. The difference between ZFS in 2003 and, the, and ZFS in 2017 is the ability to deal with those much more pathological device issues where devices simply go away. So the, these things should always give you the right data when, when, they, when they start off, and you should not undertake it lightly. We need to enshrine observability. That's been, it's been great to hear. That's a theme that we've had, I've had for a long time. Great to hear so many others um, having that same theme. We need to reward complete understanding, not merely resolution. I made the problem go away. Great, what was the problem? Did we, let's make sure that we're asking the questions that we pulled at all of the open threads. And as long as it's unobservable, which it is for the moment, firmware actually is the enemy. Um, and we need open firmware. I don't know if we're ever gonna get there. Um, I, that's like, to me, that will be the post-singularity rapture will be open source firmware. Um, you know, for some reason, people, it's, you know, it's Bitcoin and everything else. For me, it will be, it will be open source firmware. And as long as we are open source, we actually do have a quality ratchet. We can make this thing better all the time. Um, so for a couple, uh, just uh, um, in closing, I want to give you a couple of things to look at. Um, in case I've made you too pessimal about firmware, well, that'd be good. That'd be mission accomplished. But if you don't know her, you should check out Michael Elizabeth Scott's amazing, amazing rip downs, tear downs of these devices where she goes through all of the firmware that's on these things, reverse engineers them so she can hijack their functionality to do something much more interesting than people intended. So she does things like take the firmware image and actually pull it up in Photoshop, and she can use that to find out where the bootloader is. It's, it's amazing. It's actually amazing. And it's so much more, like, I just want, like, the, the I.O. to be done. Like, I am very boring compared to what's, anyway, that stuff is great. Um, and uh, we, all of our RFTs, our requests for discussion are all public. You can go check out all of that to understand what we're actually doing. Uh, if you're curious for the Node.js bit, I am going to send you to Dave Pacheco's talk. And finally, a huge thank you to Amanda Lundberg for captioning me. Right. Great. Thank you very much.